I sculpted this antenna topper for Warner Brothers. In this video, I'll show you how I did it. The world has changed considerably in the last several years, and that's because of computers and computer modeling and CG and all that other stuff and, and 3D printing. But in the case when you're given a job where you don't have a 3D model, where it's uh, conventionally drawn or there just doesn't exist, generally speaking, what the client does is give you a style guide. So this is an old Warner Brothers style guide that they gave us. So there's lots of poses in here, and there's almost never the pose that's exactly the same as the piece you're going to sculpt. So you have to kind of put go through it and uh, look and see if you can find a drawing or some reference that is pretty close uh, to what it is you're looking to do. And for this job, they want him sn kind of snarling with his tongue hanging out. So there's a pretty good piece of reference. Um, I'm only going to be sculpting the head, so I don't have to worry about the pose. But that's uh, pretty close to the piece of reference that I'm going to use. Um, that's pretty close to his eyeballs we're going to use. So you just use the style guides as reference to create the character that they ask you to create. And you have to do a turnaround drawing, which I did. So that's the first thing. So this is the actual head that I'm going to sculpt. It's an antenna topper, so he's got to have uh, the right base, and it's going to have to be round and all this other stuff. So there's always these sort of technical things and uh, you know product configurations that you have to conform to. So that's always the way it is. So this is where it starts. From this drawing, we go on and do a wax sculpt. Now this is not drawn the right size. That's pretty big. Uh, but I always draw them oversize. Then I reduce the drawing down to the actual size of the product. From the turnaround drawings, I made this wax sculpture. You can see the uh, wax is from a couple of different batches. That's why the color difference, but it all sculpts the same, so it doesn't make a bit of difference. From this wax sculpture, we make a rubber mold, and from that mold, we make resin castings. I'll show you all that process in this video. This is the Tasmanian Devil. Warner Brothers owns him. So don't copyright strike me. I did this job for Warner Brothers at their request. They paid me to do it. So uh, not claiming uh, that this is one of my own uh, characters by any means. So anyway, never mind all that. Let's go forward. Let's put a mold around this boy, cast him up, and uh, you can see that part of the process. Silicone rubber is a two-part system the rubber and the hardener. Here I am shaping the hardener before use. I've estimated that the mold for Taz will weigh about 300 grams, so to find the right amount of hardener I divide by 11. 300 divided by 11 is roughly 27. So here I'm dispensing 27 grams of the hardener into the cup. I always weigh the hardener and dispense it into the cup first because that makes it much easier to mix the rubber later. I'm going to need 270 grams of rubber. Now you can see, when I mix this rubber, it's not sticking to the sides of the container. When you put the rubber in the container first, it really sticks to the sides of the container and you have to do a lot of scraping to try to get the rubber off the sides. This way, it mixes really easily and really efficiently. Um, it took me, I don't know, about 15 years to learn that trick. I pass it on to you here for free. Put the, the hardener in the container first and you will have a much easier time uh, mixing the rubber. Now one thing you'll notice is that I, it doesn't really look like it, but I am mixing a tremendous amount of air into the rubber along with you know, thoroughly mixing the two parts. You can see there the bubbles starting to rise in the rubber and they will rise out by themselves, but it's much faster and much more efficient to pull them out with a vacuum chamber. So now the rubber is in the vacuum chamber. I'll put the lid on, hit the switch, close the outlet valve, open the inlet valve, and away we go. Now this pump will pull 29 inches of mercury. That's a very, very strong vacuum. And as it does, the rubber rises. 
you need to have about uh, two to three times the volume, empty volume, in your container to allow the rubber to rise. Otherwise, it will rise up out of the container, spill all over everything, and make a big mess. So you need to have a big enough container to allow for the rubber to rise. That's done. Let's pour it. This is sped up considerably here. The pour goes fairly slowly, but I always pour molds so that the rubber rises from the bottom. That way air is pushed out uh, away from the model and out of the cup. I mixed up the correct amount of rubber, but I'm going to under pour it here to show you this next little technique. This is a trick I learned a long time ago. If you didn't weigh out enough rubber to fill your mold, you can cut up old molds that you're no longer using into little chunks and push them in to fill the container. Uh, what doesn't work is trying to put a bunch of chunks of rubber inside the container and then pour the rubber around it because that invariably uh, catches bubbles and, and creates voids inside the mold. So that does not work. But this technique of pushing them in from the top is excellent uh, and makes very high quality molds and re recycles old rubber. So we do use it quite frequently. It's the next day. It takes 24 hours for the rubber to cure completely. And here I'm cutting the mold free from the cup. I usually trim the bottom edge of the mold. It's not really necessary, but it makes it a little bit cleaner. And uh, I don't know, just a habit I've always had. You can skip this step. Uh, I always do it. It takes a second. So now I need to cut the wax model free from the mold. So what I'm doing here is looking to see what the orientation of the model is inside the mold. I can get just enough clues from looking at it to figure out where I want to make the cuts. You don't want to cut across any areas of details, like the face. Uh, so you want your cuts to be in as inconspicuous a place as possible. Uh, if you notice, I'm making the cut very jagged. And the reason for that is that you want the mold to be able to uh, re-index to itself, to sort of uh, realign itself. And if you make the, m the cut really smooth, uh, the, the two halves of the molds can slide around. If, the, if you make the cut really jagged, they lock together uh, and, and close up really beautifully. Uh, your instinct is to make as clean a cut as possible, but that's the wrong thing to do. You want it to be a jagged, rough cut, and you don't want the cut to cross any areas where there's a lot of detail. So I'm coming up to his hair tufts, and as you can see, I'm cutting around them because I don't want to cut across fine details. And the reason for that is, no matter what you do, you're always going to have some cleanup, some you know parting line smoothing that you're going to have to do. So you want it uh, to be in areas where it's very easy to smooth out the parting line. You don't want it. And also, you don't want to cut the whole thing apart. You don't want two separate halves. You want to keep it together because that very much aids in having it not leak on the bottom, but also it aids in making sure that when you reassemble the mold, to pour the castings that it, you know there's the, the mold holds together really well uh, that's really crucial don't <laughs> don't cut the two halves of the molds apart you will be sad that you did leave it like this the mold is plenty flexible to allow for cleaning and you won't have any problems uh, when you do it like this and look at that very very nice mold and notice you don't see the chunkies that I pushed in there they're totally invisible and uh, well bonded inside it And then look how the mold halves fit together. That's what you want to see. You want to see your, you want to see the two halves of the molds locked back together just like that. And that's going to give you the best chance at getting a clean uh, parting line. Now you'll see there will be some extra cleanup, but it's pretty minimal if you do this all right. I've assembled the mold, and I know that uh, there's going to be areas where I may, I'm most likely to catch bubbles. So in order to help the resin flow into those areas, I'm going to tip and rock the mold. 
That little notch I'm cutting just reminds me when I'm pouring the mold what direction to tip and rock as I'm doing here the mold. Resin is a two-part system, just like the rubber. Uh, in this case, I'm dispensing part A. Uh, the resin system that I use is a 50-50 mix. That is equal parts of A and equal parts of B. Part A uh, can dry in air, and so the jugs get a little crusty around the rim. So I'm always careful to wipe off as much of the resin as I can before I close the jug back up. It's very important uh, that you put the lids on the jugs and that you keep air out of the jugs because air contains moisture and moisture is the enemy of urethane resin. What happens with moisture is that it causes it to foam and get a tremendous amount of bubbles. This is the B side resin. As you can see, it's clear, not amber colored like the A side. I'm going to add a little bit of pigment to it. Whenever you add pigment to resin, you always add it to the B side. I, I really don't know why, but that's the way it's done. I'm just going to add just enough pigment here to make a nice pale orange colored casting. Just like with the rubber, we use the old balance beam scale to dispense the correct amount of resin. I already know the amount that I need to weigh out because I tested it. And figuring out how much you need is basically a process of trial and error. Here I put part A and B into the mixing cup and I'm stirring them together. Here's another trick I've found useful over the years. Take a smaller mold and use it as a cap for the mold you're currently pouring. So now I'm, I'm doing the shake and rock and roll thing, hoping to get most of the places where bubbles could get trapped uh, in the details of the face out of there. Into the pressure pot it goes, and we will let it sit under about 80 pounds per square inch of pressure for 20 minutes. And we will come back after the 20 minutes are up and uh, let the air out of the tank. And pull the casting out of the tank. Looks like a pretty nice casting. Got most of the details in the face really nice. I'm just kind of just checking it over for bubbles. And oh yeah, see right there? There's a bubble right there. Um, but it's in a good spot because it's easy to fix and it'll never show. and You'll never see it. There was a little bit of flashing. That's where the uh, resin kind of runs out into the parting line between the two rubber halves, but really that's very minimal uh, and it's super easy to clean off. You just take a blade, as I'm doing here, or an X-Acto knife or any sharp blade and clean it off. There's still a little bit of a lip I can feel with my finger and just see. There you go. That's a better look at it, um, but that's pretty minimal too and easy to clean. Again, I just uh, you could use an X-Acto or a utility knife. I favor straight razor blades held in my hands because I have the best control over it. I can scrape really precisely. So basically what I'm doing here is just scraping down the high side to match the, the lower side uh, of, the, of the parting line. Um, the resin, especially when it's fresh out of the tank and just recently uh, recently cast, is very easy to work with. It's very malleable. Uh, easy to scrape. It scrapes quickly and easily. And uh, so I generally try to fix the uh, parting lines as soon after the casting is made as possible. And it <clears throat> just makes life easier. If you wait a whole day, a day or two, the resin is quite a bit harder uh, after 24 hours than it is when it's freshly cast. 
So I generally pull things out of the mold and clean them as soon as I can afterward. The razor blade is going to do about 80% of the job and then I just finish it up uh, with some wet sandpaper, like 600 grit wet sandpaper. And that uh, will just kind of match the sheen and gloss of the original casting. Uh, and it, it just works really well. As you can see, the uh, sandpaper does a really nice job. Uh, leaves a nice finish. And uh, we're ready to tackle the next problem, which were those little voids that we found uh, in the tooth and in the hair. One of my favorite materials in the shop is Magic Sculpt. I've used it for years and years and years and for all kinds of jobs. And one of my favorite uses is doing any patching or filling of holes that you might find in a casting. It's a two-part system. It's a putty and you mix it together and you dispense exactly the amount you need. And since I'm filling little teeny tiny holes, I just dispensed out a little teeny tiny side, you know, of each of the A side and the B side, the resin side and the hardener side. It's amazing how many uh, of the plastics that we work with are those, that kind of a system, a two-part system that's activated by mixing. I just make little potato chips, little flakes of the uh, epoxy putty and uh, just knead it together like this and needs pretty quickly. You have, you know, the smaller the amount and the thinner the amount, the more time, and it's also temperature sensitive, but you have a, a fairly generous amount of time to work with it. That's gonna start hardening up in, you know, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. After about an hour, it's pretty tough to work with. Um, but right here on this side of the casting, I don't wanna scrape here because I would have to scrape down the hair and re-sculpt it. So what I wanna do here is I wanna build up the low side uh, and not have to scrape the hair. My parting line is, is not as far away from the hair as I would have liked it. It would have been better had that parting line been about a quarter of an inch or so away from the ends of those hairs and it would have saved me this trouble. But really it's pretty minimal. So I'm just gonna putty up the low side, build up the low side, and then come back in. I'm gonna do most of the work here with the putty. I'm gonna make sure that I make a nice clean putty job um, I like to work with the putty, not with sandpaper. So I try to get my, my patch jobs always to be as clean as possible while the putty is wet. So I'm scraping it down. The more work I do here is the less work I do later with sandpaper and I find it much easier to work with wet putty to make a clean repair uh, than to work with sandpaper to try to re-sculpt the fine details. I finished the patching and filled the holes in the tooth and in the hair. I let it sit overnight and then a very minimal sanding finished the job. After the parting lines are clean and the bubbles are filled, uh, it's time to prep the casting for painting. My first step is to rub the surfaces down with super fine 4 aught steel wool, followed by a bath in acetone because the last prep step is to spray the piece with primer. Here I'm using Rust-Oleum primer, but we also use Krylon. Both of them come in gray and white, and either color works fine. I always put a couple thin coats of acrylic gesso on top of the primer in preparation for laying on the colors. I like to spray the primer on in several thin coats. It, the good news is it dries really fast, so you can just keep uh, spraying and turning the model and hitting it from all different angles. What you don't want to do is try to lay on a really big heavy coat uh, which might wind up running, dripping, or filling in the details. Well I've showed you everything and now it's time to paint old Taz, right? Wrong. I'm not gonna paint him and you know why? Because I don't want to mess with PMS. Not that PMS. This PMS. The Pantone matching system. The client specifies the colors of the character using the Pantone matching system. It's an industry-wide system for matching colors. That way printers and manufacturers and artists, designers, everybody uh, knows exactly what color is being referred to. For instance, uh, say to paint Taz's tongue, it's number 486, and that's this kind of pink color, and then you know the exact shade of pink to mix. But here's the thing. We have to custom mix the paint to match the PMS swatches. And as you can see here, when acrylic is wet, it's a completely different color than it is when it's dry. So color matching is really a process of trial and error. 
It often takes us longer to match the colors than it does to paint the actual model. For that reason, I think matching colors and painting is a subject worthy of its own video. Here, at long last, is the finished painted model. And here's the antenna topper. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you got something out of it. See you in the next one.